Thanks very much, Selena and Karen. And um, I, again, I'd like to thank you for all the tremendous work you do to help um, develop these webinars and to set them up and organize them. Without your help, it would be very difficult. So the first thing we do today is we acknowledge the traditional lands that Royal Roads uh, sits on. Royal Roads University acknowledges that the campus is located on the traditional lands of the Esquimalt and Songhees ancestors and families who have lived here for thousands of years. This land has been part of the fabric of the life of indigenous communities long before Hatley Castle was built and it will be long into the future. It is with gratitude that we now learn and work here where the past, the present and the future of indigenous and non-indigenous students, faculty and staff come together. Thank you for that. So the webinar today is uh, a sort of idea that I had about uh, creating a space so we could talk to one of our very distinguished alumna, uh, Dr. Ro uh, Dr. Lauren Oates, and it's entitled Finding a Place in the Humanitarian Sector, Life, Career and Passion on the Global Highway. So Again, thanks for joining us today for another webinar offered by the Human Security and Peace Building Program. We're delighted to welcome you here and what a beautiful day it is. My name is Ken Christie. I am a professor and program head for the Human Security and Peace Building Program at Royal Roads University in Victoria, British Columbia. And joining me is Dr. Lauren Notes, who's an alumnus of the Human Security Program, but as I am about to say, so much more. Lauren Oates works to achieve social change and development internationally through education. She is focused on maximizing the quality of learning and teaching through the creation of stimulating curricula, great teaching, a high standard of learning materials, and by fostering critical thinking. She has contributed to education development in conflict zones and in states recovering from conflict, especially literacy education, teacher education and open education. She's now currently executive director of Canadians for Women in Afghanistan, and she also contributes to the planning and design of the organization's education program in Afghanistan. She has designed national strategies to promote children's reading and has led studies, evaluations, verifications and gender analysis for USAID funded education projects in various countries. She's also the creator of Afghanistan's first and only open educational res resource, the OER initiative, which is called the Direct E Dinesh Library, which was the winner of a presidential citation from the American Library Association in 2018 and developed a very successful adult literacy education program known as Afghanistan Lali, Afghanistan Reads, recognized as a literacy best practice honoree by the US Library of Congress in 2017. Lauren's doctoral research with the Language and Literacy Education Department at the University of British Columbia focused on the development of mother tongue teaching resources using ICT for primary teachers in Northern Uganda. Lauren is also the recipient of a Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal awarded by the province of BC, and she sits on the board of the Syrian Kids Foundation. So this short bio, very short when you read her CV, does not, of course, does not do enough justice to the importance of her work in life as a humanitarian, but I am hoping through the conversation we can tease more of this from her. So. Welcome, Lauren. And I should also say that Lauren teaches now and supervises in the Human Security Program at Royal Roads. And the students are in awe at her teaching and practitioner work. And as the first person to read her teaching evaluations, I can tell you her ratings are always off the charts. So we have scheduled this as an armchair conversation. Unfortunately, I do not really have an armchair <laughs> coming in from this very social distancing location, but just imagine it to be the case. I do have a semi comfy chair, however, so hope you can use your imagination to see the conversation as a comfortable one, but also challenging in that this is a real learning experience for everyone. 
So I'm going to have a series of questions for Lauren, and then we can open it up for a short Q&A session in the last 15 minutes. As Selena said, if you could write your questions in the chat box, we'd be happy to uh, receive them. So let's begin. The first question is, and it's always the trickiest, Lauren, is how did you find yourself here? What was your motivation to pursue a life in humanitarianism and the difficult work you do with young women and children in trying to improve their lives and create the human security opportunity and context in which social change can happen? What in effect is, inspires you to humanitarian action? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to assume you can hear me unless I see some waving hands or anything. OK, great. Um, so yeah, I, I do have kind of an armchair, not a usual office chair. And but I wanted to have like a fireplace or something in the in the background to, um, <laughs> uh, you know, give give the whole look. But uh, we're all improvising here during COVID times. Um, so yeah, so how I got started. Um, I'm going, I, I think my journey is probably not, not very typical. Um, so, you know, can't, can't really be like a, a template. It just happened that way. And it was really chance actually um, in, um, you know, certain things happening at certain times and um, um, happening, happening to be exposed to something that, that triggered a, a passion in me um, early on. And uh, from that moment, I never questioned what my my job was, and um, and I just just trudged forward. So what happened was in 1996, um, the Taliban captured Kabul, and um, they had been sort of taking over other provinces bit by bit, and uh, and then they they got to the capital and they became the rulers of Afghanistan. And we started seeing in the news the story of what was happening to women and girls there, the edicts that they were putting in place, um, the the um, girls schools shutting down, women not being allowed to work, even to leave their homes, and and really this unheard of situation that people started labeling gender apartheid or gender side because it was it was just so extreme. So I was this unruly kid and um, and my siblings were in sports and you know gainfully occupied and my mom was kind of looking for something for me um, without success and she knew I was interested in justice. I was always sort of talking on the theme of justice. So she cut out a newspaper article uh, describing what the Taliban were doing. And, and she left it in my room. I came home from school. I was 14. Um, I read this and it just turned my whole world upside down. Uh, I certainly couldn't find Afghanistan on a map at that time, but I just knew that what I was reading was unacceptable. And, and I think as, as children, we're able to very easily um, see ourselves in, in others. And we don't think a lot about about difference. You don't have a strong sense necessarily of you know, diff different religions, different ethnic groups, different nationalities. I just saw that girls couldn't go to school and I wouldn't want that to happen to me. So I, I knew inherently this was wrong and I had to do something. And I moped around for a couple of days trying to figure out what, what to do and um, eventually wrote up this petition um, which was directed to the Canadian government and also the United Nations and, uh, and, the, and the US government. And I sent a copy to the Taliban too. Um, since then, fortunately, my, um, my advocacy skills have been somewhat refined <laughs> and uh, I, I have a little bit better sense of um, you know, my, my target audiences when I'm doing things like that. But I, was, I just quickly got a bunch of signatures and sent it off and then um, really the, the rest is history. And when all that happened, I didn't at all think this would be you know, my, my life and career, but I, I just never stopped. Um, I, I got involved with Amnesty International initially and through them um, at age 16, I discovered this organization, Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan and um, joined up there, well, started the Vancouver chapter and then got more and more involved. Um, and uh, by the 2000s, I was doing um, uh, work in the humanitarian and development sector. I'd gone to McGill and done a, a bachelor degree in international development. Um, and so um, uh, started working with other agencies and then eventually Women for Women said, um, do you wanna do some contract work with us um, for our, our education projects in Afghanistan? Um, and so, so I did that. So that's all I've ever done. Um, my sister sometimes says, you know a lot about Afghanistan and not very much about anything else. <laughs> um, uh, I ended up focusing on education and I just want to take a couple minutes to explain that. Um, to me, it makes a lot of sense and I hope it will to you too when I explain it. So 
So I, I got involved in this work um, very specifically because of the human rights violations happening in Afghanistan. And ultimately I learned about human rights violations in, in other countries uh, through the volunteer work I did with Amnesty and elsewhere. Um, but in the course of doing that, I, I, you know, I, I would be in Afghanistan, I'd be talking to women. Um, one of the early projects I worked on was a, a Government of Canada project that um, helped women's groups in Afghanistan do um, peace building and human rights projects. And we would discuss what kinds of projects the women wanted to do. And I was thinking things like human rights training and human rights awareness. And women said to me, you know, we already know about rights and we know we don't have them. We have a very clear idea that we are entitled to certain rights and those rights have been denied to us, but we can't do anything about that as long as most of us can't read and write. So it was like, yeah, duh, of course. So it felt like putting the cart before the horse. So I sort of went back a bit and, and thought maybe the place to, for me to be useful is in education, if my interest is to do something about rights. So um, I went back to school for the third time. So in between this, I'd done my, my master's at Royal Roads. And, um, and then I went to do a doctorate in education. Um, and, and meanwhile, um, my, my work in the field shifted to focus more and more on education. And it keeps shifting as I, I see my work as um, sort of you're starting at the you know, top of an inverted um, triangle and drilling down constantly as you keep asking the question, you know, what needs to happen if this is my goal? So if you have a very clear goal, and mine is for people to have the agency that they need um, to be able to realize human rights, um, and the, the sort of pathway to get there is education. So education isn't the goal, but the pathway. But even once I'd landed in that layer of education, I kept drilling down to, you know, then first it was teacher education, and I still work in that domain. Um, but then I saw one of the key things teachers need is access to good materials. Um, when they can't, you know, they may not have good access to um, teacher professional development. So at least if we can get them independent access to materials, that makes a difference. So that brought me to focus on open educational resources and, and learning materials. Um, and lately, the past few years, I've been increasingly interested in critical thinking, because that's often very absent from education systems all over the world, including um, the public education system here in Canada. Um, so I started asking, you know, how, what, what constitutes good critical thinking? How can education be used for that? So I keep, keep drilling down and I don't really know exactly where I am in the, in the triangle right now, but um, uh, that's where I, I carry on. So I'm just always trying to answer that question. Um, you know, what kind of work will enable people to have agency and specifically what, what kind of activity in the education sector will enable that? Oh, thanks so much for that answer. That's incredibly articulate. I'm, I'm really amazed that you started off so young in this uh, this whole enterprise and uh, ast astonishing, you know, 16 years old and you're already doing all this stuff. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, I'd like to focus a little bit more on uh, your work in Afghanistan with uh, women and children. Uh, you've done a tremendous amount of work um, there and uh, I'm always excited to hear about your new projects etc. Could you tell us a little bit about what your most current projects in that part of the world are and um, maybe even give us some insights into what's happening with Afghanistan in terms of the, the peace process that's going on. Uh, I, I know this is of tremendous interest to you of course. Yeah, um, yes the peace process is certainly um, uh, taking up a lot of mental space for, for me and my team right now because it imperils all the work we're doing actually um, mm -hmm. and all the rights that women have gained over the past 20 years. Um, there's, um, uh, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty and um, it's not the first time that there's been an attempt to, to have a, a peace process take root in Afghanistan. So we don't know if it will even be successful but this particular process has gone farther than any, any previous one. Um, the, the Afghan government and the Taliban are actually at the table talking to each other. Um, both seem more motivated to negotiate than in previous attempts. And of course, the, the US had made their um, agreement last year with the Taliban. So in their way, things are sort of moving forward. Um, but there haven't been great reassurances for, for women and girls that their rights will be protected, like the right to go to school. 
Um, rumors abound in Afghanistan um, that women's rights will be traded away. Um, for example, that uh, you know girls will only be able to go to school up to a certain grade, like do primary only, um, or various other concessions. So we're watching that really carefully, and we we have an advocacy program where where we engage on those issues. And um, our main operating principle is really to look to women in civil society in Afghanistan and ask them what their demands are. And then we try to amplify those demands um, in our own sort of policy arena here in Canada and internationally and in our neighbors to the south. Um, so their demands are fairly clear. Um, they want a ceasefire. They want an end to the violence. They want their rights to be protected. They want an inclusive process. They want to be at the table uh, in a meaningful way, not a token way. And, um, and they, they want uh, the right to education specifically to be protected. So those are the demands we focus on and we engage with, um, with uh, uh, politicians in Canada, with the media. We work with partners like the Feminist Majority Foundation in, in the US and um, uh, a network called Women Living Under Muslim Laws that works internationally to try to take these demands forward. So um, um, you, if you check out our website, I can put it in the chat in a bit. Um, you'll find our advocacy page and there's all kinds of things people can do. Um, sign petitions, send postcards, post things on social media. We have a lot of news articles there where you can get brushed up on what exactly the situation is now because it's um, it's hard to keep up with. So that's something on, on advocacy. Um, but day to day, you know, our, our work is really focused on education. That's the work we're delivering in the field. And in my bio, you mentioned our Afghanistan Reads program. And I'll, I'll just mention that because I'm really proud of that program. And um, I think it also shows well the power of try, trying to design international development programming in a way that's uh, evidence-based and really relying on the evidence and sort of challenging your own biases and looking at the data. So with that program, um, you know, we, we had been involved in doing literacy in Afghanistan for some time. And um, I'm talking about literacy for adults, actually, because um, a huge portion of the population didn't get to go to school because of war, migration, various other reasons. And so they are um, over age 15 and they're trying to learn to read and write. So there's classes for them. Um, we run classes, the government runs classes, other NGOs have these kinds of classes. And um, I, you know, when I looked at the results, it, it seemed very unclear that they were actually becoming literate in a sustained way. And one survey I worked on with UNICEF um, back in 2010 actually showed that um, only 30% of women, of adult women who had some primary education were literate. And the surveyors actually tested this because um, it's it's well known in in surveying technique. If you ask people, you know, can you read and write, they may feel embarrassed and they'll say yes. Um, so a certain percentage said yes, and then they actually tested them, and it turned out that they couldn't read a sentence. Um, maybe they could write their name, but they were not really literate. So all these people were going to school, and yet they still couldn't read and write. Um, and the same was happening in the adult literacy classes. They were graduating either um, with literacy that they lost eventually or not actually being literate at all. So we asked, you know, what's, what's going on here? And we started looking at different factors and we started experimenting with adding features into the program. So one of the things that we did was um, we put libraries in the classrooms for, for the, the adult students because we found their textbooks were very boring and dry and they didn't really inspire them to want to read. And they weren't that relevant for them. These were textbooks for, you know, written for grade one students. And these are, you know, maybe a, a 45 year old farming woman. And, um, you know, it's like count the apples and that kind of thing. So we put books that would be of interest to these learners in their own language. Um, and we trained the teacher to also be a librarian. Uh, and we actually, um, we trained them and we also coached them because another thing that we noticed from the data was the training wasn't, um, wasn't making a huge difference. They did very well when evaluated on the training, they learned everything. But then when we went to monitor the classrooms, they weren't applying anything that they learned. And so instead of more training, we started having coaches go out and work with them and really show them how to actually do these reading promotion activities in, in the classroom. Um, and then one of the other major things we did was um, we started working with this researcher uh, named Dr. Helen Abadzi. 
And uh, she's one of the world's most renowned uh, researchers in reading, in the science of reading. And she has studied the neurology of the adult reading brain and discovered that it's really different from the child's reading brain. And the main difference is that it's difficult for adults to get fluency, um, which is the measured by the number of um, words per minute that you can, you can read. So unless you can read ideally 60 words per minute, but um, minimally 40, you can't retain the information. So by the time you've gotten to the end of the sentence, you've forgotten the first words of the sentence. And so the focus has to be on getting that reading fluency, which is tricky for adults. And most literacy programs do not teach to that, um, in part because it's counterintuitive. Um, it's really like drill learning. It's memorization. It's spending hours and hours repeating, learning the letters, learning the words, and so on. Um, and so we, we trialed her method. She worked with us to develop a curriculum for literacy for adults in Afghanistan and in the local languages. And, um, and then we piloted it in two classrooms, but we also had a control group of two other classrooms. And within six months, we saw this dramatic difference where the treatment group were reading at just shy of 60 words per minute within three months uh, with the new method versus half that by six months in the other class. So this was just clear, compelling results that told us adopt this method, roll it out across the program. Um, so that's what, what we've done. Um, and, and we've seen great results. We test the women and they're still literate months after the program. Um, yeah, so that's the Afghanistan Reads program and just an example of um, you know, when, when you really rely on evidence, uh, I think you can, you can do good programming. Um, what else? Um, yeah, we do teacher professional development work with the teacher college system. And um, also mentioned in my bio was the directed Danesh library, which means knowledge tree. Um, this is like um, uh, a library um, of learning materials in local languages in nine languages actually. And we've since expanded that to build full courses. So that's something I'm uh, working on right now, actually behind the Zoom window, I see a, a draft course um, that I have to give feedback on today. Um, and we think that's quite exciting because there's nothing like this yet in Afghanistan. And the idea is that it will make learning accessible to anyone everywhere. Um, if they have a cell phone, a tablet, a laptop, they can take a, a course in a topic of interest. And they use our library very, very well. Um, I'll also put the address in the chat if you're interested to check it out. But some months we have um, uh, close to 200,000 people um, using our library. And um, uh, and they, they ask us um, all kinds of questions. They tell us what what materials, what topics they're interested in. Um, they send us their math problems to solve. We once had a, a, a woman farmer in Southern Afghanistan um, ask us for help identifying a certain type of grub that was eating her fruit trees in her orchard. So our team, so this is just an example of how, you know, every day is different. And some of the things you end up doing um, at, at work on a certain day, you never envisioned yourself like researching types of grubs in Southern Afghanistan. So <laughs> you could help this woman stop this infestation and find a resource um, that we can translate and put in our library for her to use. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's a few of the things I'm working on right now. That's amazing. And, and for someone uh, like me who grew up with a great love of reading, because, you know, when I was a kid, I used to read three books a day, literally. Uh, and that, that's all I did was I was obsessed with reading and, and how to understand um, what I was reading. Um, that's such a powerful tool for development, for social change. If you can teach people to read, if you can educate them in that sense. It's, it's an amazing um, developmental tool for uh, political, social, economic change, all, all kinds of change, of course. And that's why people are frightened of it, I think, because it is such a, a radical um, uh, uh, tool in, in the developmental uh, uh, program in that sense. Uh, I'd like to maybe move on to something else uh, that, that I know very much interests you. And, um we've we've talked a lot about it. I, I know you're a big fan of uh George Orwell, uh the very famous British uh writer who is most famous for Animal Farm in 1984, of course. And and many have chatted or, or many have argued that Orwell is even more relevant today than when he was in the times he was writing, of course. Uh 
What do you think of his significance as a thinker and author for these current uh, times? Um, I mean, he's absolutely more significant than, than ever. Um, and, and just the last point you mentioned there about, um, about reading, right? And why reading is sometimes recognized as dangerous. That's something that Orwell wrote about, um, you know, the, the practice of book burning that seems to crop up whenever there's mm -hmm. any kind of authoritarian system in place, we feel very threatened by um, books and the freedom to read. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love Orwell a lot, as any former students of mine here might, might mm -hmm. remember. Um, he's kind of my muse um, for, for the course I teach. And, um, and I think in life in general, uh, you know, um, there's those what would Jesus do bracelets, and mine is what would George do. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's, uh, he, I, I, yeah, I, I would say that um, his own um, views and ideas, um, it, it, that's my own political philosophy. Um, and I, I found him extraordinarily helpful to navigate, um, you know, the, the fog of war, um, mm -hmm. as, as McNamara called it, um, and kind of trying to figure out um, an ethical stance when, when things are really difficult and, um, and make some of those calls. Um, you know, he, uh, you mentioned his novels, and, and most people know him for that. They're, I think they're on the curriculum of lots of schools around the world. Um, but he wrote prolifically, uh, even though he didn't live very long, he didn't even make 50, but in the course of his life, he just churned out essay after essay on every conceivable topic. I mean, everything from, um, you know, memoirs of his time um, as a part of the colonial empire, as a police officer in, um, in what was called Burma then, and, and he was born in India, um, so those experiences... Um, on poverty in England and France during the, the time that he lived. Um, to he wrote an essay on how to drink a proper cup of tea <laughs> um, <laughs> and things like that. Um, and, and actually, I think probably one of his most important essays is the uh, politics of the English language. And that's one that I, I use so much in, in kind of my, my glasses of seeing, seeing the world. Like just yesterday, um, my team and I were looking at a, a statement that had come out um, from the new US administration um, regarding what's gonna happen with the Taliban deal that they made now that Biden is in power. And, um, and so the statement was actually a letter to the president of Afghanistan. And one of the things you notice when you read it is it's very ambiguous. So um, it doesn't say anything directly in terms of what are the actual consequences of a power sharing deal with the Taliban. Like if the, if the Taliban are part of governing Afghanistan, and they throw out the constitution. And this means things like, um, you know, women lose all, all of these freedoms. That's just covered up with, um, with euphemisms in the text. And this is something that George Orwell would have called them out on right away. And, and if you read the politics of the English language, and it's like this book, you know, you can read it in, in under an hour, um, this beautiful little essay, it, it talks about how the English language in particular is so amenable to manipulation. Um, and and you, when you read that, you'll see that everywhere after of how we manipulate the language to cover up truth. Um, and uh, and I, I think that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why he's useful in the course too, because um, I think we should think about that when we're writing and talking actually. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and really always, always try to um, be direct and clear in what we say. So. Um, yeah, there's there's the language question, and um, uh, and I, I think you know he just had so much to say on um, on on war and on human suffering, on poverty um, that um, he remains um, just as relevant to guide today, if not more so than when he is alive. So check out his his work if you know if most people on the call have probably read at least one of the books, um, but. He's one of those writers where almost all his work is in the public domain. It's all mm -hmm. free, it's all online, so you can easily access him. And um, um, yeah, he's a, a very, very, very important thinker in my view. Thank you. Uh, I think my favorite essay by Orwell was Shooting an Elephant, you know, uh, which was an essay we got in high school, you know, very early on in my high school in Scotland. And uh, I always thought, what? What's this shooting an elephant all about? And you realize how many metaphors and allegories that uh, Orwell uses in his work. And the elephant, of course, was colonialism, the colonial structure, and how long it takes to kind of die, but personified as an elephant. And it's an amazing essay 
so powerful in its critique of colonialism and uh, empire. And as you know, Afghanistan has always been called the sort of graveyard of empires, right? Because of all the the imperial powers that came and went and were, you know, floundered on the whole question of Afghanistan because so difficult to control, so so relevant to, you know, Orwell's writings are just so relevant to me and uh, of course to you today. Uh, I think I'm going to have time for one more question because we have a lot of people coming in on the Q&A and I'd like to uh, have them. I, I, I'd like to ask you a, a sort of final question about some of your insight into your highs, your best experiences working in the humanitarian field. And secondly, maybe your lows, your worst experiences, or maybe your most challenging times that, that you've experienced. I know that, uh, you know, th these are challenging times enough during COVID for a humanitarian worker practitioner, but I'm sure you have quite a lot of experience uh, working uh, in this area and, and seeing it at its best and at its worst. So if you could give us some insight into that, I'd be very grateful. Sure, yeah. The highs, um, I, I mean, I'd say a sense of fulfillment and personal satisfaction every every day. And um, I'm so, so lucky that I stumbled into this work and found what I wanted to do early on. And, uh, and, and so that helped me distinguish easily what I, what I enjoy doing and where I feel useful versus where I don't. And I've certainly had experiences where I, I wasn't feeling useful, but I was able to see that quickly. Um, I did, uh, I, I did a, a contract once where I was working with, um, I'll, I'll say a poorly led team um, in, a, in a foreign country. And I was finding every day I came, came back from the field and went to my hotel room and just felt exhausted. And I couldn't really figure out why. Um, you know, I was sleeping well, eating well, exercising, um, but I just had this sense that the project we were working on didn't matter. And, um, and it felt that way because the leader felt that way. The, the leader, our team leader of this project didn't, didn't care about the project. And that just kind of seeps down to the whole team. And so I had the sense I was just showing up and going through the motions, but what we were doing actually didn't make a difference. Um, so, so, you know, it was miserable, but I'm glad I was able to recognize it. And I use that all the time. If I'm working on something and I just feel unmotivated, I know that it's because um, this is maybe something that's not important and I should, should, should move on. Um, and then another high is just that the work is interesting all the time. It's full of challenges, which is part of what makes it interesting. Um, you know, you're always solving interesting problems. Um, so the challenges, <laughs> um, there's plenty too. And um, I guess one recent one for me is um, I, I became executive director of the organization I work at uh, about three years ago now, or two and a half years ago. And so, um, you know, my, my job is to lead and manage, and um, it's been a really enjoyable challenge. I've had to learn a lot of new skills, um, but I sometimes miss the technical work, um, you know, those times where I could just bury my head in developing a curriculum for days and days and uninterrupted mm -hmm. time to, to um to be a maker, actually. Um, I, I, there's a, a useful article, I forget the author right now, I'll try to find it, um, where they talk about the difference between manager and maker time. And um, manager time, you're kind of running around, doing all these things, you know, proving this, answering this call, sort of quick little tasks. Um, whereas maker time needs concentrated, uninterrupted, focused times. And it's really unusual lately where if I get a day with no meetings where I can be a maker for a little bit, but I find I have to do that to um, sort of keep, keep my spirit fed um, to, to do some of the technical work sometimes too. Um, and then I guess, you know, just more um, broadly, uh, probably the biggest challenge for me personally is just getting, getting my head around the scope of suffering in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the course of doing this work, I have, been told, you know, terrible stories of suffering in, in the first person from people who endured them. I've read such stories. I've seen things in, in the field. And so you, you see, you know, just the scale of it and you have to square that with what you can do. Um, I mean, for me, it's really important to face that, to look it in the eyes, even though it's unpleasant. Um, and so, you know, that, that's what 
makes me concerned these days when you hear so much about trigger warnings and, and sort of this, I think, this cultural space we're in where we're trying to um, have safe spaces and in, in terms of our exposure to things that are difficult to hear. It doesn't resonate with me as much because I think we have to see those things. We have to see the pain of others mm -hmm. uh, in order to do something about it. But also, you know, when when you're taking it all in, um, it's uh, it's it's hard to 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 tolerate, and um, you have to find that balance and make peace with what you can do about it. Um, you will not be able to do everything, even if you're you know you spend 23 out of 24 hours a day. Um, dedicating your life to a particular cause and you're super focused and you work hard all your life, um, you're still only going to put a drop in the bucket. Um, and you, you have to make peace with that. It's something I'm still working on, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, that life is short and uh, you only have so much time in this world. Um, so choose how you spend your time carefully, but you're still going to see things um, that, uh, that you can't change and you won't see changed in the course of your lifetime. And um, so yeah, so something I, I always try to say to myself when I'm trying to get my chin back up is, um, is the world is big, the time is short, and mm -hmm. there's lots of work to do. That's like my personal mantra of a sort. It kind of sounds like my personal mantra too. I'll just appropriate your personal mantra for mine because I, I do feel your pain at times, especially that management and maker thing and uh, I know that there can be a certain amount of frustration in that because I'd like to get down to writing my you know next uh, masterpiece and <laughs> whatever and you know I've got to do all, take all these phone calls and deal with all sorts of bureaucratic craziness you know and which is, is it, it limits you and you know we seem to be much more complex in our bureaucracy so we sort of put off our procrastinating especially I know that more and more people have been procrastinating under COVID. I certainly have from from doing the maker stuff when you can be doing all the other kinds of, you know, uh, time consuming things. But but thanks. Th thanks for answering that question. I have a few questions that are coming in. I'd like to just go over some of them. Um, we have a question from Haval Ahmad. And as you probably know, Haval was a former student of yours and is now uh, uh, Haval and I are actually working on a, a book together on radicalization, uh, uh, which is coming out next year. But uh, he's asking a question about some Western, Middle Eastern, and even Central Asian governments start dealing with the Taliban as a political entity, as you mentioned, for example, under the direction uh, of the United States, Qatar has officially opened an office for the Taliban in Doha, giving the group a political status recognition. Uh, in your opinion, can a group like the Taliban, which has committed major atrocities, especially against women and children, be an active part of the solution and why? Yeah, great question. Um, not an easy one. As it stands, they are certainly not being an active part of the solution. And um, those demands, those five demands I mentioned earlier uh, that come from women in Afghanistan and, and are very clear. And I should say, you don't always see consensus from you know, a movement, a women's movement or civil society, but there is enormous consensus here. I mean, across the board, everybody wants a ceasefire. The Afghan government wants that, civil society wants it you know, little girls in schools want it, just everybody. And the Taliban won't deliver that. Um, what they're doing is they're, they know that everyone wants that. So they're using it as their, their you know, the, the card they have to play. And so they say, you know, we'll give you that when you give us the governance system we want. So what they want is a kind of theocratic system where there's like a religious council at the top that is the ultimate arbiter. Um, so there might be a parliament and, and things like that, but um, the religious council would be the rule, real rulers, um, similar to the system in Iran now. Um, and, and so they want to guarantee that they're going to get the kind of regime they want in which they will have power. And then they'll say, we will give you your ceasefire. Um, but that could be far, far down the line. And in the meantime, people are dying every day. Um, you know, there's a campaign of assassinations going on right now in the country. 
um, where they're specifically going after the thorns in the side of the Taliban, the progressive people, the people who would make it difficult to impose this kind of regime, journalists, civil society activists, and, and even those who have not been killed have fled because they know they're on a, a list. And so the country's losing um, you know, some really important figures and, um, uh, and it's created just this sense of paralyzing fear. Um, and you know, not to mention the, 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 the violence against the population at large every day. Um, maybe some of you heard um, about how in May of last year, a maternity ward was shot up, <laughs> a maternity ward. So women who were in labor giving birth or who had just given birth and, and it, the maternity ward was targeted. It wasn't an accident. They didn't open that door. They, they passed other wards looking for that door. So yeah, you have to ask the question, negotiating with a group where these kinds of things are, are par for the course with them. I mean, is, is, is that acceptable? Um, and I, I think we, we have to ask that question. And right now I tend to agree with a lot of the women activists we're in touch with who say, I hope the talks fail. You know, we, yes, we're living with violence. We want peace, but what kind of peace is that? It, you know, a, a peace where we have to continue living under violence, where we have to go back to the repressive times of the policy or of the Taliban, um, or we have to trade up some of the rights that we've won over the last 20 years. That's not a peace worth living in. And indeed, they've already experienced that, right? They lived under Taliban rule. They know what it's like. And there's districts that are currently under Taliban rule where it's the same. Um, so yeah, I think uh, my short answer is, uh, is no. Um, unless the Taliban change, which doesn't look very likely at the moment, it's very hard to see how they could become, um, how, how power could be shared with them or they could become part of um, the society that Afghanistan has become today. And actually I'm gonna share a link to an event that um, we are hosting next Friday as part of the, it's a parallel event to the UN Commission on the Status of Women, which is um, takes place every March. Uh, and this is the first time it's ever been um, virtual, of course, because of COVID. So you can actually access um, the events. There's something like 700 events um, going on. So this is one that we're, we're co-hosting that might be of interest to people. Thanks so much for that answer. Haval does have another question, but there are some other questions from other people. So I'd like to uh, mention them if we get a chance to go back to Haval's second question. Uh, I have a question from a registrant. Um, how does one get the ball rolling in terms of financing and funding for projects like, like uh, this? How, how do, would you su suggest any strategies? I know this is always an important question. How, how do I get, how do I get into this? How do I, I start to get my foot in the door? Finance wise, funding wise, so important in this uh, this whole humanitarian world. Yeah, so um, in, in my organization, our funding for these projects comes from a mix of sources. Um, one major source is actually simply individual Canadians who support our work and, and donate, um, donate money to us throughout the year. And uh, we also get support from service clubs like Rotary and University Women's Clubs. Um, we have a fundraising program called Breaking Bread where people host potluck dinners and then uh, try to raise um, a certain target amount um, in one of their dinners that will fund a particular thing like a library um, in one of our classrooms. So those are obviously now being held virtually, um, but, um, but previously they, um, they've raised something like $3 million um, over, mm -hmm. over a decade and a half of, of hosting them. Mm -hmm. um, we have some government funding. Um, so we have usually had some funding from the government of Canada and sometimes from other governments. Uh, foundations, um, private and family foundations. And, but if you're thinking about projects as an individual, perhaps not through an organization, I'll give you one example. Uh, when I was doing my PhD research in Northern Uganda, um, I needed computers for the teachers I was working with because I was doing an ICT research project. And so I needed to see how they would work with, um, with, with these ICT tasks and yet there was no computers. So I needed to, provide them. I needed at least a dozen computers. So um, 
this is sort of before the time of crowdfunding platforms and all that. So I wrote an email um, describing what I was looking for and I sent it to everyone I knew and asked people to forward it on. And I think um, sort of two degrees in, um, I got um, an email from a, um, a, someone I'd never heard of before who got the email from a friend of mine um, and said, I'll, I'll pay for the computers. Here's $10,000 um, and you can buy the computers. And that took mm -hmm. probably about two weeks from when I sent the email to when, when that happened. Um, it doesn't always go that way, but in that case, just using, using the network helped. And um, I think describing the project in a way for people to see what its value is and both in that case and anything I've done individually, as well as through um, the organization I work for, always giving people assurances about how you'll be accountable for their money um, is really important too. Mm -hmm. And you know, people like to know what percentage goes to um, uh, the, the program versus administration and um, how, how you report on spending and monitor the work and so on. So anything that you can, sort of um, give the assurances that you can give people there are useful too. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, from someone else looking to, how would you, do you have any advice for someone to looking to realign their career to international developments, specifically child protection and uh, women empowerment? Um, and I guess uh, we do get a lot of questions like this, of course, how, how do you, get into this field if you're in another field is there a way to break in apart from kind of normal how well, I guess the normal channels yeah um I mean for me what I how I broke in was through volunteering um and mm -hmm. so I you know I, I I did this activist work through different organizations um as, as a teenager and then um as a university student and um, and then that led me to my first paid job in international development, um, which was with the, the government of Canada. Um, and I did that for a few years. And then I, I moved on to become a consultant. Um, and, and so I was able to actually put some stuff on my, my resume from my volunteer work that was, was recognized. And I think probably more importantly, I make, made the contacts, right? Um, so a, a good volunteer role is, is important. And, um, you can look at like there's volunteer centers all over Canada. Most most cities have a volunteer center, and they have a database of volunteer opportunities. So you can really search for something that's a where you get a chance to build your skills, and you're not just going to be stuffing envelopes mm -hmm. or something. But you can actually maybe work on a project, um, and you could get your foot in the door that way, and then perhaps propose to the organization um, something more substantial that you could work on, which is another thing I've done before. Um, saying, you know, I think this is something the organization could do and I will, I will take charge of that and lead it, like leave it to me and you can get the chance to prove yourself that way. Um, yeah, I also did an internship. Um, when I was 20, I went to New York and I did an internship at Dress for Success um, at their mm -hmm. global headquarters. They have a, an office here in BC too. Um, and, and that was a useful experience. Um, it was skills-based, so I got the chance to really learn a skill and you know they didn't just have us like uh, getting coffee for for the bosses or anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think internships are useful. Um, and then yeah, ne networking and the moment you get a chance, whether it's a volunteer job, an internship, a c contract, do your best, you know, do everything it takes because that will be your ticket to the next thing, right? If you do quality work, you will be invited back, you will be referred on to others. Um, so just, yeah, make that extra effort um, to, to get it right um, the moment the, the door opens for you. Just do, do you do internships at the, do you have internships at the organization you work for, Lauren, or, or is there volunteer work that people can do for uh, Canadian women for Afghanistan? Yeah, there's both. Um, we actually had a Royal Roads um, intern. Um, we loved her so much. We can't live without her. And we've asked her to keep to come back. Um, and uh, we have two, two women interns right now uh, who are developers. Um, uh, so they work in our technology for education program. Um, and we uh, sometimes have interns, Afghan interns in our office in Afghanistan. Um, but yeah, we'll take one or two at a time for um, our office in Canada. And when I say office, we actually are totally virtual. So um, that's, that would be mm -hmm. a remote internship. 
Um, and uh, I'm just going to actually send a link to the couple of volunteer vacancies we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, thank yeah. you. That's great. I mean, this is really great sort of practical stuff as well that people can, you know, go out and be active in and, uh, and work with. Do, do you have uh, connections with the Afghan uh, diplomatic mission in Canada? Is there a, a kind of connection there? Uh, do, do they follow your work in Afghanistan and help to support it in some way? Yeah, um, yeah, we're in contact with the Afghan embassy in Ottawa, and um, they have a nice newsletter. If people are interested, I think you can sign up from their mm -hmm. website. And, um, uh, you know, we engage with them around some of the, the issues I've talked about on, um, you know, rights of women and, and, and the peace talks, but also they have a cultural program. And um, we think that's really important too. to, you know, people know Afghanistan through the, the lens of war and what they see on the news, but um, that's only part of the story of the, the country. And uh, um, we like to play a role in sort of promoting, um, you know, learning about Afghan language, culture. We've had um, Afghan cooking classes during one of our conferences, <laughs> music. And so we've, we've um, talked with them about that too. We have this dream to bring, there's a women's orchestra from Afghanistan um, which is part of the Afghan National Institute of Music, a really wonderful school in, in Kabul. And um, yeah, they've, they've actually been hosted by the Afghan consulate in Australia before. So we thought, wouldn't that be amazing to do that in Canada someday? But then COVID happened. So that, like many other things, went on the back burner. Thank you. I have one more question from Haval. Uh, I think he wanted to answer. Uh, he was asking about uh, movements by the international community to recognize the Taliban as a political entity rather than as a radical extremist group. Um, is this a, a sort of desperate move, uh, which also explains the failure of the international community in Afghanistan? Uh, I, I know that, I mean, in the past, uh, you know, and having studied terrorism and counter-terrorism quite a lot in my career, um, governments have always said, we will not negotiate with terrorists, we will not negotiate with extremists that commit atrocities. They did this with the IRA uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, and then they were finally forced to kind of recognize, well, the IRA have a sort of legitimate base of support to some extent, right? That's the problem, right? So you have to negotiate with them. No matter how horrendous you think they are, you're not really going to necessarily achieve peace unless you know you come to some sort of realization that there are people you have to negotiate with. Otherwise, you just go to war, right? So uh, do you think that this is a kind of, um, that the international community have failed in Afghanistan? Or what would be your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, it's it's perhaps a failure in progress. It's it's not over yet, and and it is it's more mixed than that because it's undeniable that there's been huge progress um, across every major human development indicator. I mean, you have um, you know the um, like people live 25 years longer now on average in Afghanistan than they did during Taliban rule. Um, one of the things I looked at when I, I did some work with UNICEF was infant and child mortality rates and how much they changed from the Taliban's time and power to, to the present. I mean, just dramatically, it's incomparable to the normal course where these things slowly improve over time. It was like a more of a, a zigzag. Um, so, so there's a lot of gains to protect and that's why the stakes are very high. Um, and yet, you know, wars usually end in when they end sustainably and don't reoccur, it's through political settlement. Mm -hmm. So there is an obligation to attempt it and to work at it, but um, it can't be um, expedient. Um, it's going to take time and it should only be one part of the strategy. Um, the other one is the long game and the key in the long game is education um, mm -hmm. and quality education. So, um, and, and I should say more broadly, the building of human capital, right? So you eventually have a society where people don't wanna be in the Taliban because there's better opportunities where when they're on the outside looking in, they say, I, wanna, I want that. I wanna live in that society where there's quality of life, where there's opportunity, that looks better. 
Um, and, and you see that in other places that have been at war over time where um, uh, as, as quality of life improves, the, um, the motivation to, to fight goes down. Um, so that's a war of attrition of sorts, but it takes a long time. And um, there's, there's lots of work to do in the education sector. And it's not only in Afghanistan, but in Pakistan, where arguably mm -hmm. most of the Taliban are actually in Pakistan, right? So mm -hmm. we haven't talked about that, but that's a whole other side of the equation is this is not a civil war. This is a war with regional um, dynamics and indeed international dynamics, right? Um, but we have to figure it out because it's not only the fate of the Afghan people, um, but it really, it, there's international implications um, evidenced by what happened in the past when we ignored Afghanistan and allowed war and violence and oppression to fester there. We got Osama bin Laden um, hosted, hosted by the Taliban and other things like um, the opium industry goes to the most unstable places in the world. If you look at the history of where poppies for opium are grown, um, as soon as a place becomes too stable, they move on. Um, so Afghanistan is a great place right now for, um, for opium production. And so there's all kinds of, um, you know, consequences for the world at large, including us here in Canada by, by doing nothing. Um, even though that looks like the easier option, it just, it just will come back to bite us if we don't find a solution. Um, but we need far more creative inputs than we've seen so far from the key stakeholders, um, the US administration, certainly. And we need a, a rights narrative. I think we need them to say um, it's not an option to bargain away the, the rights of um, women and girls. Mm -hmm. And they do have to defer to the sovereignty of the Afghan government. And they've mm -hmm. not been doing that. Um, you know, the Americans in their deal with the Taliban, one of the provisions was that the Afghan government would release 5,000 Taliban prisoners. And the Afghan government wasn't at the table. They were like, what? <laughs> you know, so it was the US government um, agreeing to do something on behalf of another state. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there has to be recognition of the um, sovereignty of the Afghan state. And um, more importantly, what, what Afghans want. I mean, I'm, I'm always struck reading the history of Afghanistan, especially people like Peter Hopkirk, for instance, who wrote some great books on the, the great game, you know, this competition between the imp old imperial powers, etc. And it seems we have a new great game in many ways, because a lot of what Afghanistan is all about is supply routes, etc., resources. What do you get out of Afghanistan? Nobody has ever been able to, to conquer it in, in that sense, you know, and so you have this kind of still competition for resources going on. Um, and it just seems to have been updated in some ways, you know, uh, in sort of colonial or imperial terms. Uh, I do have one more question from, um, I think we'll end after this, because uh, it's a really great question to end on from Nathaniel Chang, which is what stands out from the programme in human security and peace building, and you have some familiarity with it, of course, that can prepare you for a career in this field. I know that you actively teach in our program, of course, and uh, you've had great experience and, and you were an alumni, uh, alumnus of the, the program. So what would you say is perhaps stands out in the program that, that could provide the students a, a sort of uh, a great way to get into the world of humanitarianism? Um, I think the program will give a good balance of theory and skills, and you really need both. Um, mm -hmm. When I graduated with my bachelor's degree, um, I knew a lot of theory, but I didn't really have any skills to offer. And so I knew I wasn't really ready to, um, you know, contribute for, uh, on the technical side yet. Um, so we, we try to focus on that. And, and certainly in my course, I, I include a lot on the practical skills. Um, uh, that I think you can expect to find um, in, in, a, in a job, but keeping it broad enough that it'll be applicable to whatever sector um, you end up working in within the humanitarian and development sectors. Um, so that's one thing. And, um, and just you know, the interdisciplinary nature of the program, um, people end up in all kinds of careers um, uh, within the humanitarian domain. Um, and, um, and 
and so and, and the program is relevant wherever you go you'll get those those broad skills and you'll get a network too um there's a nice mm -hmm. uh rapport that that happens among among the students and i mean i'm in touch with the students that were in my program when i did my master's still um we we work together um mm -hmm. so you you get that um valuable peer network too um yeah the you know small classes and exposure to what's out there um, it's a very, very big sector and, um, you know, you might come in with a sort of just a, a small view of what's possible and then find out what's what's actually going on in the sector, what's up and coming, um, you know, where where is the sector going so you can go in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we try to make it really practical and give you, mm -hmm. you know, um, tools and, and tips and focus on, um, you know, your eventual professional role at the same time that we also try to give you a good intellectual framework in which to do this work as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for all these insights and uh, amazing, uh, amazing discussion. I, th I think I've learned a lot. I hope everyone else has. I think Selena has a um, slide to show perhaps, share screen. So here's, just a sort of overview of the School of Humanitarian Studies, where we're coming from. We have various different programs. Um, as you'll see at the center is our wonderful Master of Arts in Human Security and Peacebuilding, which is the program that uh, I run at the moment. But we also have a Master of Arts in Conflict Analysis and Management, uh, a Master of Arts in Disaster and Emergency Management, uh, a Master of Arts in Justice Studies, and uh, a Bachelor of Arts in Justice Studies. And along with these, we also have uh, graduate diplomas. If you want to take a diploma, for instance, a diploma is usually about a year. Uh, a master's uh, course is, is normally two years, and it's the blended model where it's online and you get to come to campus for two weeks in the first uh, two years of the course. So if you're interested, you know, we have lots of information. Uh, Selena, Karen, uh, I send us an email or go onto the website. It's um, it's pretty easily nego uh, to negotiate the website. And um, again, thanks so much. Thanks to Selena. Thank you to Karen. Thanks to Lauren. Uh, just uh, incredible um, perspectives and um, really powerful, powerful uh, work in this whole field of humanitarianism. So thank you and thanks for joining us. My pleasure, it's been great. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.